Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to this talk. Uh, I'm Joel Fernandez. I work at Google. Uh, I work on uh, Chrome OS, uh, on uh, scheduler, performance, power, RCU, stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, in this talk, we're going to discuss some RCU issues. So I'd like to introduce my co-presenter. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Latreski. Uh, I have been working in Sony Mobile. Uh, actually, I'm doing kernel development, and I'm doing performance, power, thermal. <laughs> Sounds like that, yeah. Hi, my name is Rishikesh Kadam. Uh, I'm, uh, I work for Intel. I have been uh, previously working on firmware mostly, so SOC IP firmware, SOC power management, micro code, and then power and performance tuning. And uh, most recently, I have been working on uh, power and performance optimization for Chrome OS and Linux based uh, Intel devices. Okay, so in this talk, we're going to discuss RCU at a high level, not uh, in ex explicit details of how it works, but just at, at a little bit of high level so that we have enough background. Uh, we're going to discuss two of the main issues we found with RCU, uh, mostly related to power and how uh, we see that it can have tendencies to disturb an idle system. Um, so basically, just to summarize, we see that uh, in the default configuration, RCU can keep the scheduler tick uh, turned on uh, when the CPU is idle even, and there are CPU, uh, callbacks queued. Uh, this can hurt like idleness. And we also see another uh, observation with RCU that uh, it can queue callbacks, very few callbacks very often um, that are not that critical to, to the system, so it can disturb like an idle system. Uh, so we'll discuss these issues and possible solutions, and I will try to get through the, uh, uh, the content and keep questions for the end, if that's okay. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, we'll try to address questions at the end or, or in the hallway. So with that, next slide. Okay, so at a high level, uh, this is, uh, you know, the most popular use case for RCU, which is data structure read modification uh, uh, concurrently, right? So uh, in this use case, what happens is we have something called uh, an RCU read lock, which is acquired by a reader before they read a, uh, some data structure that is being protected. And then we have a writer that is attempting to uh, modify the uh, data structure. Um, and this has to happen concurrently. That's the, the main like uh, selling point of RCU is you can do this concurrently. So the way that is done is the writer creates a copy of the object being modified, uh, writes to the copy, and uh, then switches uh, some pointer that is pointing to the data structure to the new copy. However, it needs to wait for uh, the, uh, you know, it has to garbage collect the whole copy, right? Uh, otherwise, you'll run out, run out of memory. So um, it has to do so after waiting for a certain amount of time to make sure there are no more readers that have any references or possibility of accessing uh, the old object. Uh, and that's where the update uh, uh, phase comes in. So that's what read, copy, update is. Um, that's just at a high level, the most popular use case. However, it's important to note that this is not the only use case for RCU. There are several uh, different, very clever use cases of RCU. Um, and they all uh, need the same basic tools, which is they need to uh, start and stop a critical section locklessly. Um, and we can call that as a, you know, we can call those critical sections as a reader for the purposes of this talk. They may not be doing any reads or anything, but let's just call them readers. And then we need the ability to start um, uh, waiting at some point in time. Let's call that time T0. And uh, we need to stop waiting at some point in time. Let's call that T1. Uh, and we would stop waiting only once we confirm that all readers that existed at time T0 are no longer running, like the, any reader that was, uh, uh, you know, in the critical section uh, that was marked by the, the markers are no longer running, that existed at T0. If they started after T0, we don't care about those, but we care about the ones that were there at T0. So one way to accomplish this would be, um, you know, at T0, you queue a callback, and uh, when you decide that time is up and it's time to stop, then you would execute the callback. So that would, we can call that as invoking a callback. 
So this is what happens on a local CPU uh, running in kernel mode uh, when a callback is queued. That's the same T0 we were just referring to. Uh, so uh, the CPU is in kernel mode and we queue a callback T0. Uh, now uh, we have the scheduler tick that is continuously running. And just to uh, clarify, this is with the default RCU configuration. There are other RCU configuration that do other things, but with the default one, we see that uh, the timer tick constantly has to run at the Hertz rate and has to check whether there are any readers on this CPU since T0, right? And uh, if uh, there are no more readers, it reports to this global thread that there are no more readers. Uh, but it also has to do something else. Because a callback has been queued on the local CPU, it has to also check if all other CPUs have also confirmed that there are no more readers, right? Only then can it execute the callback. So it executes the callback on the same CPU that queued it after it has confirmed that it has, you know, there are no more readers on the whole system. That was kernel mode. So now in, uh, when, you, when, you, when you look into CPU idle, right, your idle, uh, and say just before you went idle, a callback was queued, and uh, and then you went idle. Now the uh, the timer tick still has to fire because according to the previous slide, we have to confirm that all CPUs have reported that there are no more readers. Um, however, we don't need uh, the upper arrows because uh, there cannot possibly be a reader on the current CPU active because the CPU went idle. So there's no, there's no way that that is possible. Um, but uh, we still have the other activity, which is we need to check if all the other CPUs have reported, have, have reported that there are no more readers so that we can execute the callback that was queued, right? So, so you can imagine the CPU is idle and we have these ticks that are constantly firing to check if, the, if RCU has uh, terminated and we can ex uh, ex execute the callbacks. So this can, uh, you know, s severely hurt power. Uh, it's interesting, we had platforms where we didn't even know this was happening and, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, that, that, that is the reality of, of, of it. So we can show you some traces. So if you want to... Hi, so, uh... So this is something uh, I discovered very uh, earlier this year. So we were running video playback on an uh, Intel Alder Lake based CPU and a, on a Chromebook. And uh, we saw that there were like a 2500 wakes per second that were happening during a video playback use case. And uh, more than that, we were seeing that uh, we had a very poor package C state residency, which is the low power state for the uh, SOC. And uh, but the CPU utilization was very low. So we wanted to figure out what's going on. So on the right hand side, you see a snapshot from Kernel Shark during the uh, local video playback use case. And uh, what you see here is, so the vertical blue boxes here are the uh, video frame boundary. So this is where uh, the audio video is decoded and rendered uh, within those blue boxes. And then the intervals between the blue boxes is the idle period where the CPU should go into a low power mode. Uh, but what we observed is a problem. So if you see the horizontal red boxes, uh, those are the some instances we observed where the CPU idle tick was staying on and it was staying on because RCU was uh, keeping it on. And uh, that was having uh, some impact uh, on uh, the power. Now, <clears throat> So in the next slide, uh, I don't want to talk about why the tick being idle is bad, but uh, what I want to talk about is how bad it is because uh, I think everyone understands that having the tick uh, is a bad thing, but I think until this point, at least I did not know how bad it could be. So in this particular use case, uh, if you see at the top, we have uh, this uh, graph and on the top graph, what it is doing is it's showing the CPU C0 state, so the active state per CPU. So you have the left hand side on the top graph and the right hand side and the left hand side is where you have the default case at that time which is you had these occasional ticks that i showed in the red box and then on the right hand side is the case where once we fix those ticks uh, this is the cpu uh, residency or load 
So between the left hand side and the right hand side on the top graph, there is actually hardly any difference in terms of CPU C states. They they are almost equal. In fact, the the only difference the difference between the combined CPU load on the left hand side versus right hand side is less than two percent. So the ticks actually do not put any load. But that is where I want to show the uh, the bottom graph. So the bottom graph is the packet C state for the same configuration. So again, the left hand side is with the occasional ticks, and the right hand side is once we fix the problem. And what I show in the bottom graph is the packet C state. Uh, so briefly here, so the uh, I want to describe what the packet states are. So the PC zero is the active packet state. Uh, that is the one shown in blue. And then the other ones are uh, deeper and deeper levels of uh, low power states. And the green one is the PC8, which is the lowest uh, or the deepest uh, packet state you can have for this uh, use case. And as you can see, between the left hand side and the right hand side, with and without tick, there is there was once we were able to resolve the ticks, we were able to see like a 25% jump in the deepest packet state. Uh, so from 18%, it went to 45%. And uh, it uh, improved the SOC power and the memory power combined by 10% for this use case. And uh, so the one key message I want to mention is that if you are trying to optimize your multimedia stack using the regular tools like Flame Graph or uh, Ftrace, uh, this 2% load from these wakes is negligible and you'll miss it. So you probably want to look at the package C states as well if you're on Intel platform, but also maybe applicable for other SOCs. And you you want to look at the wakes uh, because that is uh, that is where some of your power problems may lie. <laughs> and so Joel wanted to emphasize how bad the ticks are. They are eating up into your battery. And uh, so now that I talked about packet system being impacted so much, I want to talk briefly what the packet system are and why do we see this kind of a behavior. Uh, so before we talk about packet C state, uh, let me quickly touch upon uh, what C states are. I think most of you may know. So traditionally, SCPS C states are CPU low power states. So the CPUs will typically report their exit latency and then the uh, power break event time. And then you have an Intel governor, uh, sorry, you have an idle governor that picks the C state based on the OS next event uh, prediction, as well as the particular C states exit latency and target residency. And uh, typically the CPU C states, the per CPU C states have a very low exit latency and target residency of the order of tens of microseconds to maybe hundred microseconds. So the ticks themselves do not uh, significantly block. You can still uh, enter the deepest CPU uh, C state. Now, what is uh, the scenario with a packet C state? So what is a packet C state? So last five years ago or so, we started having system on chip uh, architectures for laptop. And uh, what the system on chip architectures do is they have a, like a power management unit which can then coordinate or which can look at the state of various CPUs as well as various the IP blocks in the SOC as well as common logic like fabric. And then it can use hints from the OS for the idle state and along with the rest of the information that is available within the SOC, it can uh, put the entire SOC in a low power state. So that is what uh, essentially the packet C state are uh, in this architecture. So basically what, and the way we use them is uh, on the right hand side, uh, this is a table for the Alder Lake uh, C states, uh, latencies and residencies from uh, Intel Idle driver in the tree. So the last two entries here, C8, C10, uh, you can say are the packet C state. So these are the states where the Power management uh, unit is actually uh, using this OS hints for the C8 and C10 to put the entire SOC in the low power state. Of course, looking at the uh, rest of the SOC components as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the, the main takeaway is that, uh, you know, it's extremely expensive these days to disturb a CPU in, in the idle state, right? Because the, the whole SOC goes into this low power state and it takes, it's much more expensive to come out, come out of it. Right, right. And the thing I want to emphasize is uh, it's not like uh, packet C state is the culprit, right? I mean, uh, yeah. with this additional logic, you are able to enter deeper C state. So you have low, lower power today than previous generation. But if you want to take advantage of that, then you really have to look at your wakes of the order of ticks. 
previously what would happen is uh, you would look at wakes which are within tens or hundreds of microsecond and you may neglect the wakes which are in milliseconds because they are too far off and they do not impact power but if you want to use this extended deeper c state then you also want to care about uh, the packet c state so here for c8 the target residency is like 800 microsecond so if your tick is uh, one millisecond which is the case for the chromebooks uh, then and we have multiple uh, uh, processes running the tick then you are probably going to block the package uh, c8 so you want to look out for those uh, high latencies and uh, so i talked about the problem and the impact and now joel will explain how we will address it yeah, so if like, uh, you know, if uh, in certain configs, keeping the tick uh, on uh, during idle is so bad, is so bad, then why does R RCU do it, right? And this is again to support the use case where uh, there's a desire to execute callbacks, RCU callbacks on the same CPU they were queued. And the advantages of doing this are, you know, all the advantages you can think of for the per CPU execution of something, right? Like keeping things on the same CPU. So cache lines are hot when you queue a callback. So executing the callback will access some of the same data structures. So you'll get the cache uh, benefit. Um, also executing callbacks on the same CPU. This whole, all these callbacks are in a list. So executing on same CPU means uh, you don't need to do locking uh, uh, whereas if it was on some other CPU, you need to now synchronize the uh, queuing and dequeuing of callbacks. Uh, and then, then the other benefit is uh, elimination, uh, elimination of uh, locking, uh, locking and lock contention. I, I mentioned that, uh, thread breakups, yeah. So yeah, if you, if you were to like execute callbacks on another, on another CPU, you would have to probably do it in a thread on another CPU and then acquire uh, some kind of lock uh, to synchronize, uh, stuff like that. So I can also mention one thing that it's, uh, when we do in this per CPU, per CPU, it means that we are really good uh, to number of CPUs. So it's actually scale it to number of CPUs and it's good for big systems. So for, for busy systems and, you know, large CPU systems that don't necessarily maybe care about idle power or something too much, maybe it's okay, but it's not okay for, for us. Say we don't want any of these advantages and we just want the tick to be turned off already, uh, you know, when the CPU is idle. Uh, for this, uh, we have a config RC, no CB CPU. Um, and this is something those who care a lot about embedded systems, power, so forth, should really look into whether they have it enabled or not, um, because apparently not everybody knows about it. And uh, the idea is that, again, like, you know, you have a thread that executes callbacks, so they don't need to anymore be queued and dequeued on the, on the same CPU. So when the callback is queued and CPU goes idle and the tick is turned off, uh, now that uh, CPU doesn't need to have the tick on anymore when CPU is idle. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, obviously this now has the disadvantages which, which were previously advantages, right? Now you have locking and these kind of things. So it depends on your use case. If you have a lot of callbacks being queued, and uh, stuff like that, uh, you know, maybe it's not a good idea. So you have to test and, and see, uh, see what happens. There could be performance regressions. Um, but for power and, you know, isolation of CPUs and things like that, it could be a very good idea to do. And config RC, no CV CPU moves both the uh, uh, grace period uh, start and the execution of the callbacks to, to the thread. And another thing to note here is that because the callbacks are executing in a thread, uh, it is possible for energy aware scheduling to move the threads to low power CPUs and uh, keep the big CPUs idle and with the tick turned off, right? So it's, it's great for power. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the experiments show that there is almost a 25% difference in power with using config RC, no CV, CPU. It's funny that uh, when this was config RC, no CV, CPU was developed, uh, uh, the use case wasn't power at all. It was uh, something else, I believe CPU isolation um, and HPC, uh, stuff like that. Frederick can comment more on that, but um, it does save a lot of power, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we see. Uh, and to, uh, 
make it easier for people. So just uh, in enabling config RC, you know, CVCP is not enough. You have to pass a boot parameter that tells RC which CPUs uh, need to, you know, uh, queue callbacks and execute them in a thread and things like that. So to make this easy, we added a no CVCP all boot option. So if you enable, uh, sorry, not boot option, config option. And if you enable that, uh, then you don't need the boot parameter anymore. Uh, so, the, so the next question is, can we do even better? And uh, this is the observation we see that on a mostly idle system, we have these few callbacks that are queued constantly, uh, even when the system is relatively idle. Um, and uh, we, see, we call this a trickle kind of effect, where you have these like, you know, five, 10 callbacks that are constantly being queued. And every time this happens, you know, it's very disruptive. So I wrote a tool called RCU Top, which I uh, will hope to, uh, uh, you know, merge into the kernel sources, where um, you can monitor at a high level all the RCU callbacks that are being queued and executed in a periodically refreshing interface. Uh, and we see, um, you know, on Chrome OS, at least we see that several callbacks are constantly being queued uh, when the system is just doing nothing. Um, and every time that happens, it's very uh, disruptive. Um, so uh, this is a uh, trace of, uh, you know, um, just the device doing nothing and the display is on. And uh, every 16 milliseconds, we see in uh, yellow that the um, closed system call is uh, queuing a callback and uh, triggering like the entire RCU machinery. Um, so. This is because the display pipeline opens and closes uh, graphics buffers, which I believe is DMA buff, and uh, that triggers just opening and closing those buffers triggers uh, triggers RCU. So with this, uh, um, uh, uh, Vlad will share uh, his experience on Android. Yeah, hello again. So I would like to talk about Android workloads, and uh, what I need to mention here is that if you want to save battery life and battery. Uh, please use config RC no CB because as uh, Joel mentioned before, so uh, everything uh, happened in uh, K traits and all these K traits can be uh, run on any CPU and it's up to scheduler to decide uh, where to put uh, a task to invoke these callbacks. And when it comes to energy aware scheduling, so it's a good choice for it to decide where to invoke such callbacks. Yeah, uh, so here I would like to talk about a little bit about a uh, static image use case that is, uh, yeah, uh, here I would like to talk about static image use case uh, that is probably the most important in uh, Android workloads. So basically all of you daily uh, run into such use case. So it means that uh, in these states we would like to save power as much as we can. So it basically means that a CPU stops refreshing panel and it, switch, it switches itself uh, to itself refresh uh, rate. Uh, then uh, CPU spend most of the time in deeper C states. Uh, SOC bandwidth is minimal, memory bus, L3 cache and everything. Uh, run on its minimal capacity because the idea to save power. So, and what we observe in this uh, static use case that uh, we have kind of uh, login system, and it does a lot of opening and closing uh, file operations. And these actually operations, they apply pressure on RCU subsystem. And as a result, in this test case, static image use case, we have a lot of wake-ups uh, 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 coming from RCU subsystems. So on the next slide, I will show you. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, this is actually trace output, F trace output, but it's a post processed F trace output, and uh, uh, it's actually no CB CPU uh, configuration. And you can see that in static image use case, uh, so the trace was taken during 30 seconds. And in this test case, you see that most of the wake ups that we run into are belong to RCU OP and RCU OGK traits. So it's a 40,000 each. And uh, yeah, a trace was taken on ARM big, big Little System. So, and according to this trace, it's obvious that RCU is the main resource 
a source of wake-ups. Uh, on this slide, I, uh, you can see that uh, most of the wake-ups, uh, actually, we, so it belongs to VFS file, file system and SE Linux subsystem, so during the login. And uh, these two subsystems apply pressure on uh, RCU doing memory recline. And you can see it's a file-free RCU operation, inode free by RCU, I call back D3 and AVC node free. And the most point with this is that we only invoke one to 10 callbacks only uh, during static image use case. In, if you go next. Yeah, and uh, on this slide, uh, you can see that I traced uh, RCU batch start RCU events. And you can see that uh, mostly four CPUs, it's a, big, it's a little cluster, a small capacity cluster, it's disturbed by these wake-ups and the time between all these wake-ups, six to seven milliseconds interval. So what is quite a lot. Then I bypass to Joel. Yeah, so let's explore some possible solutions to this and uh, drawbacks and so forth and where we are today. So one of the things that can be done is to uh, set the Jiffy still first FQS boot parameter and what this boot parameter does is it delays any any RCU processing at all uh, when a callback is queued by those many jiffies. Um, so this sort of can be used to see what the light at, at the end of the tunnel is look, looks like if you don't execute RCU callbacks for a long period of time, uh, you know, uh, well, not callbacks, but if you don't do RCU grace period processing for a long period of time and then you finally do it, um, you know, so this this sort of just using this, we can see that there's three to four percent power we can save on top of RCU no no CV, which is significant. Uh, and there are some problems related to doing this. As I said, it's not something you can do, which we discovered that it's not a, a, a you know a production option. Uh, and I will discuss the issues. Uh, so. Right off the bat, we see that running the Chrome OS tab switching test, where we switch between two tabs in the Chrome browser, we see that latencies go up because something in the kernel does synchronize RCU, which, uh, you know, because of the Jiffy's till first FQS change that we made, uh, the latency of that goes up. Uh, we see that F-trace, so running F-trace itself uh, slows down, uh, at least when you run it with trace CMD, uh, because uh, it does like various things uh, like writing to the set F trace PID and things like that, resizing the ring buffer, uh, which also uh, calls synchronized RCU. So I saw that uh, trace command record function graph can take like uh, minutes to, uh, to, uh, to finish running and stuff like that. Another uh, case we see, uh, this we saw with Chrome as boot up is that um, I found out uh, the hard way that um, uh, synchronized RC is actually on the critical path of our boot up, um, uh, of our, you know, once init loads and everything, because we enforce SE Linux, and SE Linux also does synchronized RCU uh, uh, when it does the, you know, enforce uh, stage. Uh, another use case. Uh, which does uh, use RCU is the uh, per CPU ref reference count uh, primitive in the kernel, which has two modes. One mode is it, it uh, modifies the ref count uh, in a per CPU basis, and then it switches to this atomic mode where uh, it does this atomic uh, per CPU, uh, sorry, uh, atomic ref count increase. And switching from the per CPU ref count uh, mode to the atomic mode requires uh, synchron requires call RCU, so we will slow down slow that down as well with the Jiffy still first FQS. So this uh, basic this example shows us that we cannot assume in the kernel that uh, all RCU users uh, reclaim memory. We know most of them reclaim memory or something like that, but as I was showing you earlier in the slides, uh, that that's that's not a valid assumption, and this certainly shows us. So. We cannot use Jiffy still first FQS. However, uh, we also tried uh, using the expedited uh, boot option, which speeds up synchronized RCU. However, it still does not return our boot performance regressions with using Jiffy still first FQS. And this slide shows us that uh, the boot time 
uh, well, the power, uh, we see power improvements with no CB. And then with Jiffy's, we see the 4% power improvement. Um, however, the boot time goes up significantly. And then we can get some of that boot time back by using uh, the expedited RCU boot option. However, we don't get all of it back. So Jiffy's is just not, not at all a possibility. So what we thought was looking at this problem, looking at this problem, uh, we, uh, what is needed is selective, uh, selectively, if we can identify RCU callbacks that can be, uh, you know, identified as just delay these ones and don't delay everything on the system, then maybe we can uh, get somewhere. So uh, we started thinking about a new API called Call RCU Lazy. Um, you know, and it's an uh, V5 right now, that series. And there are several th things we have to be careful about, RCU barrier, hot plug, uh, memory pressure, where we cannot indefinitely delay callbacks that uh, have to reclaim memory uh, and stuff like that. So this slide just shows how complex grace period processing is. When uh, you queue a callback, all of these stages happen and it's really, really intense. Uh, and the idea is to just delay all of that if only uh, callbacks that are annotated as lazy are queued. So we wouldn't do any of this um, you know, heavyweight stuff when uh, only call RCU lazy uh, callbacks are queued. Um, and so we came up with several design approaches. Uh, are we done? Okay, yeah. I think we. I think it's good. So um, uh, yeah, well, we came up with different design approaches. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the approaches we, uh, uh, the latest approach we've tried is to uh, use this thing called the bypass list. So instead of, so there's this thing called the bypass list. Let me explain that briefly. What what that means. Uh, so. Uh, we, you remember I told you with no CB CPU, we have this lock contention that is now introduced because you have to lock the callback list. So that actually, uh, actually has been compensated by this thing called the bypass list, where if lots of callbacks are queued, we queue them into the bypass list and uh, only flush them out to the main callback list after two Jiffies. So we have adopted uh, this approach where we uh, reuse this bypass list um, and we basically put it into overdrive. So instead of two Jiffies, now we want something like 10 seconds, like just keep them in the bypass list, don't let RCU know about them. And we have protections, like if there's memory pressure, then we flush the, the bypass list. Or if the 10 seconds or whatever number of seconds have passed, we, we flush the bypass list. So with this, we can actually hide the callbacks temporarily without letting RCU know about them at all. Uh, and we see that this gives us the same kind of power improvements we see with RCU, uh, with the Jiffy still first FKS boot option. In fact, uh, is it more? Or I think it's, uh, it's about the same, 4% or so. And we get the uh, extended C state residencies that Rushikesh was talking about. So it's pretty good. And th this is a link to the patches. Uh, you know, you're welcome to check them out. Uh, I hope the V6 should be out in one week or so. and then. It looks promising. Paul is uh, very supportive with merging it and so forth. So with this, uh, Vlad will talk about his experiments of Android with uh, uh, with these patches. Yeah, yeah briefly. Uh, actually, it's another test case. It's a home screen swipe. And uh, on the top, you can see that we uh, it's the same. It's RCU batch start uh, traces. And you can see that we have plenty of them. And uh, such behavior or, or such pattern, it actually uh, makes a lot of noise. For, or when it comes to wake-ups. And uh, thanks, uh, thank, thanks to your yeah, scheduler that it, it makes use of only four CPUs. If we, for example, if we used a high capacity CPU, power drain would be much more worse. So uh, after applying RCU Lazy V6 variant, you see that we actually eliminate noise completely. We have only few uh, few events. And if you move now. Yeah, and also I just, as an example, I took a power, uh, I put some power plots uh, of this home screen swipe, swipe test case. Uh, so actually on the top you see default variant and on the, on the bottom you see patched variant. So we have approximately 3% delta, but uh, we can detect it. It's, uh, it's uh, constant. And 
uh, also I need to mention that it also depends on the platform because in our case it's ARM platform. It's pretty good optimized when it comes to idling CPU, waking up CPU, and so on, comparing to Intel platform. So it depends on uh, on platform. So, but as I mentioned before, through percent but it's uh, we can detect it, and it's repeatable. Uh, with the panel turned off, it's probably six percent. Right? Yeah. So running the same tool that I showed you earlier, the output of like RC top, we see that the callbacks are only getting queued and not executed. So this tool is sort of like really handy to confirm that, uh, confirm which callbacks are getting queued constantly and which ones can be made lazy. Obviously converting call RC to call RC lazy is something that a subsystem maintainer has to accept. Uh, as a patch. So once you identify a callback that you feel like is unnecessarily having the sense of urgency, you can uh, send a patch to, to fix that. And we'll certainly send patches as well. Um, and there are some drawbacks of, of using this, which I want to be clear about. So um, one drawback is uh, if like say uh, some subsystem writes a new driver or something like that, that uh, queues a new, uh, uh, RC callback, but doesn't use lazy, then that would again like bring us back to situation where RCU activity can cause noise and disturb the CPU idle and so forth. Also, there's a risk of call RCU lazy accidentally being used, like if the user doesn't you know know what they're doing and they use call RCU lazy when they really want the callback to be executed uh, soon. Uh, that can probably hurt their use case. And this comes back to documentation, so we, we are going to be doing our best to document the new API and uh, make sure everybody understands how to use it. Uh, and there is a risk of memory pressure, right? Because we're really uh, severely delaying our C callbacks. Uh, we do have a shrinker, and uh, you know we have taken our uh, precautions about this, but uh, yeah, um, we're not entirely sure if there's some extreme condition where uh, uh, memory pressure will, uh, you know, own the system. We haven't seen it, but, you know, you never know. So testing is in progress and so forth. So with that, we're done. Uh, I really want to thank some people like Paul McKinney for mostly putting up with us and, uh, you know, helping us out and all this kind of stuff. And uh, for to Vlad and uh, Rishikesh for uh, really, like, supporting me and uh, moving this work forward. Without them, it's not possible and all our sponsors and organizers for this conference uh, because it has been really useful, uh, especially for this work. And also to Frederick uh, Weisbeck for really like reviewing the code and uh, finding out lots of issues, uh, you know, with, with the code and so forth. So with that we have uh, two minutes for questions and then we can talk in the hallway as well. All right. So this is very useful information. Uh, I had first-hand experience with uh, call RCU regress, regression in Android. So it took me <laughs> some time and actually Paul's help to figure out what it is. It would be really nice to document all the kind of downsides of okay. enabling NoCD configuration. Yeah. And it's not apparent that actually call RCU might not just uh, the scheduling of no call, uh, of, of call RCU not, might not only be delayed, but the call RCU itself might regress because of the additional locking. So if you have a lot of call RCU, they will regress your fast pass, which, you know, calling call RCU, you don't expect it to take longer with this new configuration. Yeah. So it so. would be really nice to have a list of possible downsides. Okay, so let's talk about that. And I'm interested in your use case where you see the exit path. I remember you telling that it regresses, so this might help that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's go to the next question. Uh, and one more quick question. Uh, yeah, like, will, will there be any um, API to drain the lazy as a bypass queue? ABI? Yeah, well, so in my case, I had to... Yeah, no, there's no ABI change. Literally change it to underscore lazy and that's it. We handle everything behind the scenes. Okay, so in my case, I had to re implement pretty much the same idea, but I also need uh, drain API to basically, when process exits, it needs to say, okay, okay I, I, I actually that, need to destroy it. Yeah, I okay. think we can take care of it. Yeah. Okay, cool.